Beep, beep, boop, bop. What are you doing, dude? What are you doing? We graduated three years ago. Why are you reading Unit 8B Myers Motivation and Emotion, Emotion, Stress, and Health? Dude, my girlfriend says I have to be more emotional. Oh, I've heard that one before. You know what, Frank? Let's just make a video on it. All right, Abe, take it away. Sure. Our body adaptively responds through emotion, and emotions enhance our survival by focusing and energizing us. It's like when Myers talked about how his heart started racing when he lost track of his toddler. But Peter, his toddler, was found eventually. There are three distinct components that go into emotion. The first is physiological arousal, such as when Myers' heart started pounding when he couldn't find Peter. The second is expressive behaviors, like when Myers started walking around the store faster and faster. And the third is consciously experienced thoughts and feelings, such as how Myers started to wonder if his son had been kidnapped. Now, among the theories of emotion, there is one large controversy. Does physiological arousal precede or follow your emotional experience? The first answer, James Lange theory, which says that physiological arousal does precede emotion. The second answer is Canon Bard theory, which says that physiological arousal and emotional experience are simultaneous. And the third answer, two-factor theory, Physiological arousal and cognitive awareness of the arousal are both necessary to experience the emotion. So after the stimulus, one must experience arousal, then label it cognitively in order to experience the emotion. We don't have a definitive answer as to which theory is correct, but that's what makes the controversy a controversy. Very true. Regardless of which theory one feels holds the most weight, none can deny that the emotions of our mind are constantly influencing our body's actions as well. This is due to the autonomic nervous system. <laughs> autonomic. <laughs> Regardless of which theory one feels holds the most weight, none can deny that the emotions of our mind are constantly influencing our body's actions. This is due to the autonomic nervous system, or ANS. Simply put, the ANS is the way that the human body translates emotion into physical responses. When a mugger pulls a gun on you in a dark alley and you step back in fear, that's your autonomic nervous system kicking into action. The ANS, or autonomic nervous system, has two parts. Basically, one part hypes you up in fear or arousal, and the other calms you down. The first system is the sympathetic nervous system, and that kicks in when you're aroused. When the mugger pulls out the gun, or you lean in for a first kiss on a date, the sympathetic nervous system will cause you to perspire, your heart rate and breathing will increase, and stress hormones will be secreted. You can remember this because if you're mugged, your sympathetic nervous system is sympathetic to your problem and will help you out by elevating your heart rate. The other system is the parasympathetic nervous system, it responds to stimulus that will calm you down. When you're laying on a sofa, petting a cat, the parasympathetic division will decrease your heart rate and slow your breathing. Aside from these two specific systems, different emotions affect the body differently. Happiness, for example, causes the muscles of the mouth to contract, while embarrassment causes blood to rush to the cheeks, causing one to blush. But Abe, could you tell me more about cognition's role in emotion? Sure. Cognition can actually define emotion. That's the key point to remember here. And there's also this thing called the spillover effect, where our, our aroused response to one event can spill over and affect our response to another event. Let's test this effect. Frank will be demonstrating the spillover effect. Of course, we need a source of arousal to have emotion. So today, we'll be using pure adrenaline. Sir, it's prepared. Ready to go. 
In this experiment, we'll see that if the aroused subject enters the room and interacts with another happy person, the subject will tend to cognitively label his emotion as happiness. Good day to you, sir. Yo, what's up, bro? It's a How's pleasure going, to meet you. Oh, man, same here, same here. It's been you a seem great to be day quite so far. happy today. Oh, yeah, man. Fantastic day so far. Now, on the other hand, if the subject enters the room and interacts with a disgruntled person, the subject will tend to cognitively label the, his emotion as anger. Whew. Get out of here, man. What are you doing? Yo, get off this couch. <laughs> Thus, as Myers puts it, arousal fuels emotion, but cognition channels it. If we're feeling aroused, then how we cognitively label the feeling defines the emotions we'll experience. In this case, Frank took his cognitive labeling cues from how I was feeling. Now, while cognition can define emotion, it does not always precede emotion. In fact, we can react and feel emotion without a cognitive label or even without awareness. In one experiment, researchers used fMRI scans to observe how the amygdala responded to subliminal, subliminally flashing fearful eyes. The image was flashed so quickly that it couldn't be interpreted consciously, only subliminally. The researchers found that happy eyes caused little activity in the amygdala, while fearful eyes triggered much more pronounced activity, even though the participants weren't aware of seeing the eyes. However, Another researcher named Lazarus emphasized that while our brains react to lots of information without our conscious awareness, all emotions require some cognitive appraisal of the situation for us to know what we're reacting to. We get instantly scared when we hear bushes rustling because we appraise that sound as a potential threat, even though we can't label what the threat is specifically. It could be a bear. Roar! Scary. All in all, conscious thinking and automatic emotion together guide us through our lives. Just like Abe was talking about with the example of the flashed eyes and the subliminal messaging, our brain is constantly at work unraveling context clues from its environment. Nonverbal communication is a huge factor in all human interactions and a perfect example of this. For example, a weak, dead fish handshake denotes to us that the person is also weak but a strong handshake tells us that the person is confident and self-assured. This is a valuation process is automatic, and our brain takes in hundreds of visual cues alone from subtle expressions along the face. For this reason, a great deal of communication is lost in digital communication, as an online apology can never sound as convincing over text as it can face-to-face. -face. But as good as the brain is at detecting emotion, we also have limits. With one study showing humans are incapable of telling when someone is lying versus when someone is telling the truth. Gender plays a huge role as well. Women are far better at detecting these subtle emotions than men, but they also experience stronger and more complicated emotions overall. Females also are far more likely to experience empathy than men and to be able to detect it from others as well. So we know now that the brain can pick up on subtle differences in facial expressions and actions. But is that true for every culture? Well, that's a complicated question. The meaning of a gesture can vary across cultures. For example, after I'm done checking over Frank's A-push homework, I give him the A-OK -okay sign to signify a job well done. But if Frank were from Brazil, he'd be very offended from this gesture. Sua zara, hundo fagisada! But the signs of emotion are common across different cultures. Blind children who have never seen a face still tend to exhibit the same facial expressions for emotions as everyone else. For example, they'll shake their heads when in a defiant mood. Now, emotional expressions can help us survive. This is what Darwin argued. For example, we may widen our eyes in surprise, like this girl here in order so that we can take in more information and be better prepared to confront the situation in front of us. Finally, we must note that people from different cultures tend to exhibit different amounts of emotion. This is what you were asking about. Mm. 
Cultures emphasizing individuality tend to display more visible emotions, whereas Chinese culture, which encourages its people to adjust to their peers, tends to display emotion less visibly. So different cultures express different amounts of emotion. Now, facial expressions not only convey emotion, but they can also amplify and regulate emotion. Try it now. Fake a grin. Now frown. Did you feel the difference? This effect in which facial expressions feed our feelings is called facial feedback. If you're not convinced, in an experiment, the frowning facial muscles of 10 depressed patients were paralyzed. Two months later, nine out of the 10 non-frowning patients were no longer depressed. With all the small subtleties in the ways that humans determine emotions, I was surprised to learn that most psychologists consider there to be only 10 base emotions, with certain others being merely a combination of the primary 10. The main emotion we'll zoom into here is anger. Anger is generally caused when we view another's willful action as deleterious towards ourselves. Anger is one of the emotions that society tends to discourage, instead pressuring people to find catharsis or emotional release. That being said, research shows that generally, the best way to control one's anger is to ignore it or simply control your temper, rather than venting your frustration like Tristan Thompson and uh, Draymond Green in this picture here. Well, Frank, job well done on the video today. Absolutely. I'm on my way to my girlfriend's house to give her these roses right now. I think she'll really appreciate them. Those roses are half dead. Bro, don't even worry. I got the psychology of emotion on my side. And I find myself in the middle, in the middle, in the middle.